prayer offering during this time. So if you're helping up that, if you'll make your way forward. God, we thank you. God, we thank you, Father, for your presence. We thank you for your truth and the truth in Scripture. God, we thank you that you are on the throne and in control of all situations. Good or bad, Father, you're still there. God, we thank you for the ministries, God, that we get to be a part of. We thank you for our church, God, and what you're doing in this community. God, I pray that we are just inspired to do better and better to the best of our abilities. Live for you, our King, our Creator, our Savior, the Redeemer of our souls. God, we love you. Be with us this morning. God, we invite you here. Even though we are not perfect and we are sinful, God, we want to be in your presence, Lord. It's in your name we pray. I'm 
Uh, number one, uh, some of y'all already know uh, that uh, we're going to have a children's volunteer meeting um, over in our old college room, but it's a kid's chapel now. Uh, and so that's going to be, just as a reminder, right after church, if you're interested um, and knowing more about volunteering in our children's ministry, you can just kind of head over there. Shouldn't be too long of a meeting, uh, but uh, that's where that will be. And then the second thing to let you know about is there is an insert inside your bulletin uh, with our core classes. And so we've done the first two. Uh, the third one is on knowing what your spiritual gift is and how you've been shaped by God. Uh, for his purposes in your life. And I'm going to be teaching that. It's just a one hour, well, a little bit more than that, uh, class right through that wall. There's a room on the other side of it. And so we'd love to have you here Wednesday night. 6.15 is when that starts. And so if you want to come, uh, be happy to see you and uh, enjoy the time together. All right. So th- th- we have been working through uh, uh, this series of messages called It's Time. And just looking at the different times that we go through in life, uh, that's important for us to know uh, how God wants us to manage those times uh, so that we do it well and that just kind of remain under the blessing of God and the protection, the refuge of the Lord. So there's, there's ways to do all this stuff that we have to handle in life and there's ways not to. And so this morning, I want to talk about just the times that God tests us. And, you know, when you're going through a test, you don't always appreciate those tests because they're hard and they're difficult and they stretch you um, and they're just, they're uncomfortable. But on the, on the back side of a test, as long as you do it well, on the back side of a test, you look back on the test and I hope, I would hope that you would look at it and think, man, I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that I had to go through that. I'm so thankful I got to live through that. I'm so thankful for the lessons that I learned in it. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't fun, but I have an appreciation for it. Um, I shared a little bit with my life group today at 10. There was a time uh, a few months ago, back in the spring, kind of toward the end of the spring, that for me personally, just on an individual level, I went through this this test that I had in my life, and it was single-handedly the most difficult test that I've had to go through. I, I've, I've, you know, like you, I mean, I've been through a lot of tests, and, and I know how to get through them, I know how to push through them, I know how to pray through them, I know how to fast through them, but this was one of those I didn't know how to get through it a, at all. But everything's good now, but it was, a, it was a rough time in the moment. So looking back on it, very hard, very difficult, very trying, wasn't quite sure how to handle it. Uh, but now on this end of it, guys, I, I so appreciate it. I wouldn't trade what God did in my life for anything in the world right now. Because on the back side of it, one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life. So when we start talking about tests, I just want you to just kind of keep that in the back of your mind because they're not bad. Actually, what God is wanting to do with the test in your life is to do good to you in the end. That's, that's his ultimate goal. It might, now we'll talk about the difference between a test and temptation in just a minute, but that's the, that's the goal that God has for you, to do good for you in the end through whatever test that is that you're living through in the moment. Now, there's a lot of different tests that you go through. Some of the ones that I have been through, just, you know, coming to salvation and the faith in Jesus was a test because I lived life this way. This is what I believed. This is what I, who I was. And then all of a sudden there's, you're presented with a gospel, right? And, and that you need to trust Jesus and accept him and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And so what Jesus, and if you've never done this, just, I'm going to tell you, what God is asking you to do is to agree with him that how you've been living up to this point right now is wrong. Like you just need to change your mind about everything that you've done and all that you've believed and turn your life over to Jesus. That's not an easy thing to do. That's a test. Like, are you going to trust him or not? Are you going to believe him or not? So that was a test for me. Baptism was, was a test for me because I was kind of raised in the Episcopal church, got baptized as an infant. So, you know, called my mom and dad and said, hey, you know, knowing Jesus is the best thing in the whole wide world. I'm going to get baptized. And, you know, that didn't sit well with him, right? Because... You were as a kid, like, why do you got to do that again? And I got baptized. I don't even know if I've ever even told them. And I'm, you know, I assume they, they know that I have been. But that was a test for me. Uh, when, when I stepped out of seminary and went to be a pastor for the first time in, in, a, in my first church, that was an, an enormous test for me. Because I'd never been in church, wasn't raised in church. I had no idea what a pastor did except what I saw on Sunday morning, on Wednesday nights. So here, here's what I knew about pastoring after seminary. Because so like after I'd been in school for three years, I knew they preached on Sunday morning. 
I knew there was a Bible study on Wednesday night and I'm pretty sure they went and visited people during the week. That was it. That's all I knew. So I said, Lord, there's no way. That's why I didn't take a full-time church when I got out of seminary. Because I didn't, what do you do for 40 hours out of the week? I had no idea. So I took a, a bivocational church. We started off with five people. And, you know, so that was a huge test in my life. And we were there for about 11 months. And then this church called us when we were, you know, 26 years old, 25 years ago, and said, hey, we want you to come and be the pastor of this church. And I, thank you, but no thank you. Right? That scared me to death. And so there was another test in my life where God said to me, are you going to believe me or, or, or not? You want to wander around the desert for 40 years, you know, like the Hebrews did because they weren't willing to trust me? Or are you willing to, to trust me and take the leap of faith and go do what I've asked you to do? And, and so, I mean, obviously this was, was our decision. But, but there were so many different tests in life that I ran across. And so your list might be similar. It might be very different than mine. But you should at least think about how God has tested you along the way. And then the good that he has brought out of it for your life and for your marriage and for your kids and, you know, all the, those things like that. So just so you understand, though, is that there is a difference, and this is important, between temptations and tests. Because when you're going through them, we get them mixed up. Even I do. I had to scratch some things off my message this morning because I was like, that's not a test, that's a temptation. So we, we, we get them mixed up because a lot of times they feel the same way. They might, not, they might even look the same to us from, the, from our perspective, but the two are very, very different. So here's the first thing you need to know about temptations, and this is from James chapter 1, and it's this, is, is that God tempts nobody. So you should never say, whenever you're going through something, that God's tempting me because he can't be tempted, and therefore, since he can't be tempted, he's not going to tempt anybody else. And here's how he says it. And remember, when you're being tempted, don't say that God is the one that's tempting me because God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation actually comes from our own desires, which entice us. It's like, hey, what do you think about? Ah, sounds good to me. And so then we're enticed and then we're dragged away. And these desires, they give birth to sinful actions. That simply means that you feel it, you think about it, and then you, then you do it. That's the giving birth to the sinful actions. And then when sin is allowed to grow, when you allow that to roll on and continue in your life, you know what happens? It brings death, like spiritual death does. Like we're, we're just dead on the inside because of what we've thought about, felt, done, and then continue to do. That, that's the end result of that. And so God never tempts us to sin. So the other thing about temptation is you need to understand the origins and where it comes from. So we know that Satan took Jesus out in the desert. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and he tempted the Son of God. Turn this rock into bread because you're the Son of God. You've not had anything to eat. Go ahead and do that. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Bow down, worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Y'all can go, y'all can go read that. But Jesus was tempted by the devil. So sometimes, sometimes in our lives, we, that's, that's where it comes from. It's coming from the demonic, from the satanic. Other times, it's coming from what James says over here in chapter 1. This is just me. Like, the devil did not do it. Gary did it. The devil didn't make you do it. You did it. You felt it. You thought it. You acted on it. That's you. That's not on God. That's not on Satan. That's on you alone. So sometimes the origin is, is us. And then the third one, which is, which is true only because of the other two's influence on it, is the world in which we live. And so because of you and me and everybody else that lives in the world, there's a whole lot of stuff in the world that, that serves as a temptation to us. Because of the satanic and the demonic and all of their influence in this world, there's a lot of things in this world that, that acts as a temptation to you and I. And so you've got the devil, you've got us, and you have this world in which we live. And all three of those kind of working together, but we're, we get tempted a lot. So the difference, though, between temptation and tests is this. So God tests you for your good. Satan tempts you for your harm. Thinking about what you're going through in life, there's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself, and, and it's this. So if the struggle that you're going through right now is a struggle to do what is right and to do what is good, that's a test. If the struggle that you're going through right now is to do what you know is evil and what is wrong, that's a temptation. I'll take two of the things that I scratched off my list of tests that literally this morning, I'm like, that's not a test, that's a temptation. So when I got saved when I was in college, 
come out of an unchurched, you know, non-Christian background. So I was doing all the things everybody else used to do. So I was a believer and I was sitting in my apartment. It was Christmas. Everybody was gone from, from College Station. And I thought, I just want to go drink. I mean, I just, I want to go to the bar. And I was, uh, I was kind of filtering it through my mind. I was thinking, well, there's nobody really here. And if I go, you know, I was 21 at that point. If I go, then, you know, nobody's even going to know that I'm there. And so I'm just going to go. And I was like, I can't do it. I don't want to just, you know. And so there was this battle that was going on inside of me. And I'm like, I got it. I got to get out of this house, right? And so I just went to the mall and I start walking around the mall. And guess who I meet? My preacher, right? I'm like, hey, I see you, man, right? And then, and then, and then the temptation's kind of going away a little bit. And then I walk a little bit, further, and the music man, that's what we used to call him. The music ministers, what, it's like, hey, Gary, what's going on? Because I kind of, you know, worked at the church a little bit. Um, and so he was like, hey, Gary, what's going on? And then all of a sudden it was just gone, like the temptation. So it wasn't a test. Because a test is what, when you struggle to do what's good, the temptation, it was a temptation for me because I was wanting to go do what was, what was evil. The, the second one was, was when I was college and I was living in the dorm rooms and, uh, and you know, sexual immorality is just kind of a thing, right? You know, you sleep around and I, I was sitting in my dorm room and I thought, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go look. That's just the truth. I'm going to go look. And y'all are laughing. Okay. All right. So... <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm like, I gotta say no to this. I've got to say no. I like I don't need this is not good as a believer. And and so I was reading and I just I just started praying. I was reading Isaiah and Isaiah was, you know, saying to the Lord, you know, whom shall I send? Whom will I go or who will go for me? And Isaiah stood up to the Lord and says, God, just send me, I'll go for you. And then I thought, I was like, God, I don't want to embarrass you. Like, I don't want to go out, I don't want to go out and know that I'm a believer and then go find somebody to sleep with. That's just not what I need to go do, and I, I stayed there, okay? And so that was, that was, that was a temptation because that's trying to move me to do what is, what is wrong and what is evil. And so understand the difference between a test. A test is, hey, I'm struggling to do what's good and what's right, and a temptation is I'm struggling to do what is wrong and what is evil. And so you need to know the difference between those two things. So how, this is what I'll, I'll give you four ways, how God tests you And then why God tests you. So number one is this, and this is how God tests you. He will test you with barely enough. We don't like, I don't like barely enough. I don't like barely enough sleep. I don't like barely enough money. I don't like barely enough time. I I don't like barely enough. What we like is more than enough, correct? We like more than enough money, more than enough sleep, more than enough time. But there will be moments in your life along the way where God is going to tempt you with barely enough enough. And he's going to watch to see what you do with scarcity in your life, what you do with lack in your life. So here's what happens in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verses two through five. He says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord, your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and and this, this is the test. And he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you. Your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. And so here's how God tested them with barely enough. He let them go hungry. He was like, we're out in the desert. There's not an H-E-B around every corner. There's not produce and fields. You've got these mass of people that are just wandering through this desert. And he allowed them to go hungry. I don't know if you've ever truly been hungry before. I don't know that I have. You know, I've not eaten all day. Um, and then, you know, dinner time rolls around. I'm like, and I'm, I'm hungry. You know, we feel that. But I've never gone two, three days without food. I don't, maybe some of you guys have, but I've never, I've never, I've never felt that before. But when you, when you go hungry, when you barely have enough, the emotions that we feel is that, are this, that we're uncomfortable, that we get a little, we get a little angry. If you're hungry, it's hangry. We, we, we just get frustrated with the people who are around us when we haven't had enough sleep. So when we go through life and we barely have enough money and barely have enough sleep, like how are we going to respond to that? 
So God tests you in that way. And he tests you in that way for the purpose of knowing whether or not you're still going to obey his commands when you barely have enough. So when you barely have enough sleep, are you still going to be a decent human being to the people who are around you? Like when you get up and you've lost the whole night's sleep because you've got young kids in the house or maybe you were sick or somebody else was coughing all night long. I mean, when, you, when you've barely had enough, are you still going to be kind and considerate and thoughtful of other people? When you barely have enough money, are you still going to be generous with others? Are you still going to step out and maybe even give to them out of your poverty? I mean, are you still going to behave that way? God wants to know how I'm going to react to barely enough. Am I still going to be faithful to God or am I going to get angry with him and say, I'm out. Like, I, don't, I don't want to have any. If you can't do this for me, if you can't provide this level for me, then I'm not in any longer. I'm not following you anymore. And so God wants to know when he tests us with barely enough, if we're going to be obedient to his commands. Second reason why he does that is to teach us that God is enough. So he lets us go without so that we begin to learn the lesson that we have plenty with the Lord. You go back to Jesus in the desert, right? 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. He's not eaten. And the devil comes and says, hey, here's a stone. It turns to bread. What does Jesus do? He actually quotes Deuteronomy chapter eight. That's what we just read. That it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus knew that barely enough was not a problem because God was more than enough. That's what God wants to teach us in this test. When we have barely enough, he, he wants us to begin to understand and to learn that he is more than enough for us. That's why I test you with that. Second one is this, is that God may very well, and pretty much does, test you with things that are not your fault. There are a lot, and I, just depending on your choices and decisions in life, this is probably true for most of us, okay? The majority of the problems that you have in life right now are probably not your fault. Probably not. Somebody else said it and it created issues in your life. Your children are just acting a fool and they are creating problems in your life. You didn't do that. It's not your fault. It's their fault. The people you work with, they're not taking care of their business. They're not doing their work. It's ending up on your plate. You're having to pick up their slack. That's not your fault. That's their fault. But you're having to deal with, like you're being tested by things that are not your fault. You've got people that are above you, people that are, are below you in work. And we, we all have things that are put on our plate that were not our fault. It was somebody else's choice, somebody else's decision. They did it. They said it. They acted that way. And we're having to deal with the fallout from it. So God tests us, things that are not our fault. So in Psalm 105, King David actually is reflecting back on Joseph. Now, we talked about Joseph the last couple of weeks. So we're not the only people who think about him and what God did through him and what God taught him. David was thinking about him as well. So I want to read this Psalm in Psalm 105 and tell you what he says. So God calls for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. And then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And they bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. And the Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door and Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household and he became ruler over all of the king's possessions. And so Joseph was hated by his brothers, not his fault. He was thrown into a pit, not his fault. Sold into slavery, not his fault. Accused of rape, not his fault. Thrown into prison and forgotten about, not his fault. God allowed every single one of those things to come into his life as a test in order to test his character. So when you deal with problems, when you deal with people, when you deal with situations that because of their choices, their behavior, their issues in their life, and it's landed in front of you and you're having to deal with and, and pick up all of the pieces that are there and it's not your fault. Listen, it is a test and God is testing your character. He wants to know that when you've been sinned against, will you still forgive? He wants to know 
that when you've been slandered, will you speak kindly of? He wants to know that when somebody else has lied about you, will you seek revenge or will you turn the other cheek? God wants to know that when no one wants to speak to you, will you still be a friend to them? Like he wants to know that. When you are suffering for no fault of your own, he wants to know what will your character be like? Will it continue to reflect the person of Jesus Christ even when it's not your fault? See, we get bitter. We get angry. We get frustrated. It's like, it's not my fault. And so we think sometimes when it's not our fault, it gives us permission to behave in a way that is not like Jesus. And that is not permission. It is a test for you to do the right thing. Even when somebody else has done you wrong. Listen to what he's, uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Paul said, hey man, the evil things that are said, not my fault. The abuse, not my fault. But, but when they abuse us, we're kind and gentle. When they slander us, we speak kindly. You see, so his, and he understood that his character was being tested by the issues that other people had brought into his life. When it wasn't even his fault, he's still faithful to God. Number three is this, is that God will test you with the weight of responsibility. So we all know that weight. You get married, there's responsibility there. You, you have a job, there's a responsibility there. You have children, there's a responsibility there. You make commitments to people, there's, there's, you feel that weight of responsibility. God wants to know what you're going to do with what he's given you. So there's a parable that we talk about often in the book of Matthew chapter 25 where a man was going on a journey and he gives some of his belongings to some of his servants or his slaves and to one guy he gave like five talents and to another guy two and the last guy one because, because he wanted to see what they were going to do, right? So when he gave them to them, what did they feel? They felt the weight of the responsibility, did they not? They did. They were like, oh my gosh, I've got stuff that belongs to him. What am I going to do with it? And so two of them dealt with the weight of the responsibility well. They, like, they, they matched the test. They did what they were supposed to do. They went out, they made more money, and they brought it back in. And when the guy came back from his, his trip, it was like, hey, here's yours and what I've earned. And so they were faithful with the test of the weight of the responsibility. What happened to the third guy? He did not care for the weight of that responsibility. He took what he had been given, he dug a hole, he hit it, whichever version you're reading at the time. He said, and he just, he, he just stuck it away. What did he do? He did what he wanted to do. That's, that was the whole point. He's like, I don't want to feel the weight of the responsibility of the master. I don't want to feel the weight of my marriage. I don't want to feel the weight of the responsibility of my children. I don't want to have to feel the weight of the responsibility of a commitment. I don't want to have to feel the weight of a responsibility of a job. I don't want to have to feel the weight of whatever responsibility is out there that you guys don't like. I don't want to have to feel that weight. And so I'm just going to take it, I'm going to stick it aside, and I'm going to do what I want to do. God is testing you. So in your marriages, with your spiritual gifts with the resources that you have, with the friendships that you enjoy. I mean, all the things, all the good things that God has given you, those are from him. And he wants to see whether or not you're going to be faithful with that weight that you feel and the responsibility that you have to the people who are around you. And so how are you going to do in school when you've been given that that responsibility. How will you do at work when you've been given that responsibility? How are you going to handle your family and spiritual leadership guys with your children and your wives? How will you handle that responsibility in your life? Will you carry the weight of that responsibility and pass the test? Or will you stick it off the side and go do what you want to do? The reason why God does that, he wants to know whether or not I'm going to be faithful. He wants to know whether or not you're faithful. And it's not faithful for a week. It's not faithful for a month. It's faithful for the duration of of our lives. Fourth test is this, that God will test you by confronting you, specifically confronting you when you're being hard-headed and stubborn and don't want to listen to him. Because if you want to fight God, God will fight you. He will be kind. He will be compassionate. He will not destroy you. That's not the purpose of the fight. Remember, all the tests are to do good to you in the end. But if you want to take some swings, God will let you, he'll play around for a while and then he will confront you and he will humble you. 
So here, here's a passage out of Genesis chapter 32 with Jacob, who was very stubborn and hard-headed. It says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man who is God, okay, it's an epiphany of God. A man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of his socket. So God could have won the match any time he wanted to, just playing along because all it took was a, was a touch and Jacob's hip was wrenched out of his socket. But the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. And Jacob said, will not I let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked, he's Jacob. And Jacob actually meant deceiver. So Jacob was having to confess some things that were true about him to God that he was a deceiver and he'd been very deceptive in his life. Your name, God says, will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you're going to be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said, and why do you want to know my name? The man replied, and he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been spared. And so, you want to be hard-headed? You want to be stubborn? You want to just tell God, like, like I'm out, I'm not, I'm not doing what you want me to do? Listen, God will confront you. And that confrontation of God is a test. It's a test to see whether or not you will yield to him. Don't, don't misunderstand it when God kind of plays around with you a little bit. He's giving you time before he disables you and wrenches your hip out of socket. My youngest son, that sounds rough, but listen, it's all for your good, right? So my youngest son, he always wanted to box me when he, when he was little. And uh, so I, literally he was, how tall he was, I had to get on my knees and I had these really big kind of fluffy boxing gloves and he'd have his little helmet on, right? And I'd let him get in some shots sometimes, you know, build his confidence a little bit. And, uh, but I'd just play with him, right? I mean, and, and sometimes he would just, just run in swinging like this. And every now and then he'd get a good shot in on my chin and he'd think, oh, man, I won. I'm like, you didn't win anything. I'm playing with you because I could literally knock you out cold at <laughs> any moment I wanted to. This is all fun and games for me. It might be serious for you, but it's, it's fun and games for me. So th- th- just understand, when you want to get hard-headed, you want to get stubborn toward God, he, he's just playing with you. Like he's just entertaining you for a little while to give you time to yield and to submit to him and to realize that, listen, fighting against God is not a winning idea. You're not going to win. And if you keep pushing it, you know what he's going to do? He's going to, he's going to confront you and he's going to touch the, the hip socket there and he's going to wrench it loose from you and he's going to leave you disabled. For the rest of his life, Jacob walked with a limp because he didn't know when to quit confronting God. He didn't know when to quit pushing against God. And so when you in your stubbornness and your hard-headedness, and you know, we get like that sometimes, when you feel God stepping in and convicting you with the Spirit of God living inside of your life and confronting you over some things that you need to change or maybe some things that you need to do, pay attention. Pay attention. Because He will win every fight with you. And so yield, submit to Him, and live. That's why God confronts us, because he wants to teach us the importance of submission to him as Lord and Savior of life. We take everything that we've talked about, and we're bringing it all back to this. God does this for your good. You go back over to Deuteronomy, God says, listen, he let you be hungry. He let you walk through this wilderness. He's let you have barely enough. He's let you be tested. He's let you, you know, have to deal with the the faults of other people. He's let you go through all of these things, but he's done it for your good, for your good. He loves us and he cares about us. And so the tests that you go through, you need to be able to differentiate between the temptation and the test and to understand when you're going through the test, it is ultimately to do good to you in the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. God, I pray that you would just do an amazing work in every single one of our lives, God. And Father, I pray for those this morning, God, that that their test today really is about faith in you, Jesus, that they would yield to you, that they would no longer strive and fight against you, God, but they would just by faith trust you into their life as their Lord and Savior and, and receive Jesus through prayer. 
God, for the rest of us, Lord, if, if we know that right now we're going through a test in our life, God, that we would see it for what it is, that we'd understand that you are trying to stretch us and to grow us and to mature us and to just bring us into the men and the women that you want us to be in Christ. And so, Father, I pray that we would cooperate with you in those moments. And so, Father, we love you, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's stand for this time. Listen, as we sing, uh, there'll be a, a couple of us down front. If you want to come and pray, we'd love to pray with you this morning. If you're interested in joining what God is doing here in a second, that you would uh, you come. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Spirit, come make us humble. Turn our eyes from evil things, and Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. And give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another And God let us be A generation that seeks That seeks your face O God of Jacob And God let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob, will seek your face, oh God of Jacob, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Have a great afternoon, we'll see you next week.